All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of On the Margin. Uh, today, I'm joined by repeat guest, uh, uh, James Davolos, and we've also got his colleague, uh, Shalom Jacobs. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Thanks for having us. Pleasure to be here. Yeah. Um, guys, so what, what I really want to, to dive deep into today is this sort of nebulous uh, sector uh, that we've sort of been referring to as, as the shadow banking sector. Uh, but specifically, what I really would love to talk about is commercial real estate. Now, James, uh, about a month and a half or so, at end of January, you came on the show and shared a, uh, a, an anecdote from uh, one of your colleagues who was at a uh, commercial real estate conference, right? And you were talking about some of the strains that were, that were going on there. Well, this is the uh, aforementioned colleague, uh, Shalom, is, uh, has actually joined us. Um, so maybe, uh, Shalom, I could kind of kick things over to you and maybe just set this up by saying that uh, there's an enormous amount of uh, focus that's been directed to strains in the banking sector, right? We've had several high-profile banking failures over here in the United States. We've had an, a very high-profile failure over in Europe in the form of Credit Suisse, uh, which was acquired by uh, UBS. And now uh, sort of people are looking for the next shoe to drop and folks are worried that it might be the commercial real estate sector. So could you just talk a little bit about that? Is why do people, why are people maybe worried about the commercial real estate sector as, as a space? Um, and then talk about whether or not they're, they're right to be. Absolutely. Um, so first of all, thank you again for having me. Um, so worried about the space, um, I think we all know what happened um, in the financial world, that basically our rates doubled in just over a year. If you go through history, um, we've done a lot of you know background on this. Um, any other time, there was inflation, and we all knew we needed inflation. We all knew what was going on, um, but it was always at a much slower pace. So, developers, um, real estate entrepreneurs had time to refinance, um, bring in more capital do whatever they had to do to stabilize their assets. And we know what happened over here is so many people, billions of dollars, which you know we can talk about a little bit later on in another segment of the multifamily, um, which has nothing to do with what we're talking about um, on the banks that went down so far, um, but there's no way they can catch up. The rates went up too high. Most of them were using floating rates, um, two, three year bridge money. And those rates went anywhere when they started at 3% and they're now paying 7, 8%. And they all thought, you know, they'll be able to go in regular bridge loan, do what they have to do, either develop, re um, up the value, you know, just um, value add, uh, bring the rents up, do exactly what we all do in real estate for many years. They thought they could do that over a couple of year period, which we've all done for many, many years. And all of a sudden they're caught in this bubble and all of a sudden their 3% went, their bridge loan went to eight, nine percent. And for them to you know try and stabilize the asset, they're in the high sixes, where they all um, you know, did pro formas on the after the bridge money at let's say four and a half percent. So not looking too good. Hmm. Now let me um just uh brain of a five-year-old here. So let me just see if I can walk through and sort of re-explain uh, what you're just mentioning there. And if my understanding of the way that it works in the commercial real estate space, the way it actually works. Typically, uh, let, let's say you want to uh, invest in some commercial real estate. You'll first try to finance that through a bank. And we can talk about how it's mostly the small and regional banking sector that made these sorts of loans. You go and buy a commercial real estate space, like let's say a large building, you collateralize that loan with the actual space, right? That you're that you're purchasing, and you finance that typically with a variable rate. Um, so now, basically, what's happened is when you had this bubble that we were kind of talking about in in bonds and real estate, people basically bought at uh, you know they finance things with a variable interest rate. They locked in a very low rate of return, and the variable rate has gone above the rate that they're basically getting on the yield that they're getting on that asset. Is that about the size of it? I would say that's almost correct. Yeah. The only thing I would just add is I would say not everyone obviously bought with a variable rate, but most people yep. that thought there's a value add, the whole idea is is come in with less cash, um, get this, you know, get a higher LTV, a higher loan to value from the bank, um, do the work, get the rents up, do some work in the apartments, mm. office building, whatever it would be, a couple of years, brought the value up. Now the bank's going to lend you more money, take out your money stabilize the building and put on a long-term debt of five, seven, or 10 years. And obviously they got caught in that. So. Yeah. 
So, so now what happens when those loans sort of get turned upside down? I actually want to show my, uh, and, and then my, my, my sort of follow on question to you there is, uh, why is it, this is a, uh, for those of you who aren't uh, following along on, um, on video, this is the percentage of uh, small US banks that hold the uh, commercial real estate loans. And it's like 70, 70% of CRE loans uh, are held by uh, small US banks. So, you know, my two-part question, uh, and to, to, to the both of you here, whenever you want to kind of step in, James, I know I'm, I'm grilling you on the uh, shalom on the, the specifics of commercial real estate, but uh, why why is so much of the, are so many of these loans held by by small banks? And then well, what happens here, right? Like how long does it take in between, like what happens when, uh, yeah, basically the the financing goes above the the yield that the asset is producing? Sure. I mean, well, I think that obviously Shalom has a lot more a better understanding of kind of the nuances of the commercial real estate market. But, you know, long story short, it's easier to get money on these terms from smaller banks where the regional banks and community banking is actually a good business. Uh, and it's actually 100 percent critical to the functioning of the economy, both real estate and other small business activity. But they can do a lot more of these more speculative loans because it's part of a broader relationship and it's part of kind of their overall business profile, where if you go to the large money center banks, it's not really as important to them to have this type of relationship or you know, looking at maybe a loss leader or a more speculative line of credit to then feed into deposits and asset management and other business lines. So you know, that's kind of the, the the soup and nuts of it. But, you know, once you get beyond that layer, I think Shalom has a lot more insight into kind of what happens when, you know, things get tricky. And, you know, long story short, the clock's ticking. Absolutely. Absolutely. And look, I think yeah, you just summed it up really well, um, you know, without getting into too much detail. But the whole signature bank was exactly what you just said. Um, relationship bank, you know, um, we were with them for many years and Many of my colleagues were with them for many years. They were basically only lending in New York. Um, so that cut out, you know, a big portion of, you know, a lot of the other assets that people had, including ourselves. Um, but they were your one-stop shop. They would do, you know, from your regular day-to-day -day banking, which they were absolutely awesome with. Um, then you had the same group that was underwriting your loans in New York. Um, and then any business line of credits that people had, medical, billing, all that, they were doing everything. They were doing it all from, you know, one department, um, one bank. And like you said, you're not getting that with the bigger banks. You're not getting that with the top four, the big four. You're just not. Um, so there really definitely, I think there's an absolute need for those banks, especially, you know, we have a lot of real estate um, through the fund and, you know, through uh, other uh, entities that we have um, all over the country. Um, Dalton, Georgia, Pell City, Alabama, just to name a couple. And, you know, the local banks have been absolutely fantastic since I started in real estate in 2001. And, you know, they, they wanted to help, you know, young people and just any developers or people coming in and wanting to better their town, their city, and, you know, put money in. And they were just thrilled. And they wanted to, like you said, they wanted to lend you money, um, maybe more favorable rates. Um, you know, the, the, the smaller banks always took recourse as opposed to non-recourse, meaning that you were actually person, yeah, you had, someone had to, had to personally guarantee the loan. Um, but it was always a pleasure. They understood it. When COVID came around, if there, was a, there was an issue, they were the first ones to call and say, can you make the payments? Mm. They were the first ones to call us. The big banks didn't care less. And they were happy to put your loans on, you know, on still for three months, give you time to catch up. They understood what was going on. They understood that not, none of the tenants were paying rents. And they understood that you had to pay expenses all the way through. Um, we have loans without mentioning names with, you know, big institutions that you all know and deal with every day. Um, they didn't even pick up the phone once to ask how, what, where, how are we going to get through this? Mm. Yeah. Oh, sorry. That, that's a really good point. I think that is, shouldn't be under, um, appreciated is that everyone I know that dealt with signature bank with First Republic Bank, people in private equity, hedge funds, small businesses, and then ubiquitously with all of these real estate properties that are spread out throughout the country, they loved their regional bank because they were there to support them, support their business. I don't know the last time I've heard anybody tell me that they love their 
you know, money center bulge bracket bank. So, you know, it was a good customer service. It's not like, you know, these crazy speculative people doing stupid things. People love them and they were a value add on both sides. I'm, yeah, I'm completely with you. I generally, whenever you see kind of people chirping from the cheat seats and saying, oh, these these idiots, they didn't know what they were doing. I find it pretty useful to try to take the other side of it. And, you know, if you look at the history of banking in the United States, I've shown this chart on, on the margin before, but if you go back to the 1960s, there was something like 25,000 banks. And, you know, it's been a one way trip, uh, you know, down and to the right as there's been enormous consolidation in the space. And, you know, that's a, a different discussion for another day if that's a good or, or bad thing for the economy. But definitely one one output of that has been fewer larger banks means they need to service fewer larger clients. That just makes business sense, right? So who kind of gets left behind is these smaller banks. And if you're a smaller bank, you need to find a way to compete, right? And one of the ways that you do that is you you might pick a certain sector, right? Like Silvergate did or Silicon Valley Bank did, or you up your customer service, this business kind of one-on-one -on -one stuff. So I think these people kind of, I, I feel like uh, the regional banks have gotten unfairly lambasted here. Bit. If you don't mind, I'm just going to add something to, to yeah, the whole thing that I think is important. On the flip side of that, um, because people had relationships, again, especially Signature, um, you know, uh, we have clients and you know people in, through our, through our real estate um, that have 50, 60, 70 loans with Signature. Um, and let me tell you something: not all of them were pretty. Not all of them were making money. Not all of them were above water. But because of the relationship and because, thank God, they're making money in most of their other deals, they had plenty of cash flow, et cetera. Cash flow was never an issue, and Signature Bank knew that. Mm. So I'm saying even if there was a couple of loans that maybe you weren't exactly where you know, the bank would want to underwrite it today based on what happened with COVID and everything else, especially office buildings in the city, et cetera, they knew they were paying. And the clients knew that they were going to pay because they didn't want to mess up this wonderful relationship, like I said, of, of actual day-to-day -day banking, per, personal line of credit sometimes, and of course, all their other loans that they had. Some of them cross collateralized sometimes not. Now, obviously, you know, that, that's over. And um, the FDIC is, you know, going to be selling these loans or whatever they're going to be doing with them. That whole relationship is gone. So if someone has, let's just say for argument's sake, I would say a big percentage of, I don't know exactly the percentage, but a big percentage of the signature bank loans were for sure non-recourse. Um, do you want me to get into the difference between non-recourse and non-recourse or that? Yeah, actually, please do. Yeah. Sure. So basically the banks, um, especially in the US, it's not really a thing that's done so much in Europe from what I understand. Um, although I'm already, originally from the UK, but um, I didn't really I go to school there um, for college, et cetera. So all my education is really from the US. Uh, but when I tell friends in the UK about it, they're like, what? There's such a thing as non-recourse. So basically, most banks, they lend you money and you have to sign a personal guarantee, um, whether that's on your house, a line of credit, a piece of real estate, and you're personally liable for that loan. Um, in the US especially, um, I'm not sure exactly when it started, but they came up with a method called non-recourse, which basically means is that if this every asset you have basically is in a different limited company, LLC, and if one, if you have 10 assets, one of them is not doing well. And if you give it back to the bank, you give back the keys, as they call it, um, you're basically not liable for the debt. So all of a sudden, just say for argument's sake, you bought a property for $10 million. Um, you, the bank gave you seven and a half million dollars. And now the city went to pot. There was a hurricane, something happened. And now the property is worth $5 million. And now you can only sell it for $5 million. You're two and a half million dollars in the hole. If you're a recourse, which most, like I said, you know, everyday banks are, then you'd be liable for that two and a half million dollars. The bank would then sell the property for five million. They would have the right to come after you for the two and a half million dollars. Non-recourse means get back the property, don't do anything wrong, don't do anything, you know, against any of the rules, et cetera, on the loan documents. Give back the property, you're off the hook. Wow. So yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, I, you know, one of my questions for you about these about these sorts of loans is, uh, 
you know, like if you look at what happened with Silicon Valley Bank or some of the bigger banks, an enormous percentage of their loan book is in treasuries or mortgage-backed securities. So we've probably all at this point seen the loss. We've shown it on the show of this gigantic, scary-looking chart that the FDIC published about unrealized losses. Now, since then, what uh, the authorities have done is opened up this window, the uh, BTFP, right, which allows these banks that might have large unrealized losses on their bond portfolio to park treasuries or mortgage-backed securities, and basically the Fed will lend to them at par. So if they're trading for 80 cents on the dollar today, they can you know, get 100 cents on the dollar back to meet any deposit outflows. And then the Fed, it's kind of it's supposed to be a win-win because they're not taking any uh, credit risk there, right? The the idea being that the United States would never default on on a treasury. Now, this is this is different for the case of these small regional banks, right? First of all, they can't use the BTFP facility, um, and this is not this is not a credit extended by the U.S. government. So, you know, my question to you is, what is the impact going to be for these smaller smaller regional banks? And then. I'm also just looking at, I'm sorry, I'm piling like three questions here into one, but I'm also looking at this, this chart of, uh, here, let me see, sorry, uh, of, um, of occupancy rates, um, you know, by, by different cities. So we've got Houston, Dallas, Chicago, Los Angeles, um, basically all the, the big metro areas um, and looking at vacancy rates in 2022 versus 2019. Um, and you can see that the bright blue bar uh, over the, is the, 2022 rate, and then the dark blue bar is the is the 2019 rate. And if you're fault not following along via video, you, you get the gist. The bright blue bar, the occupant, the vacancy rates are much higher in 2022. So I'm wondering if there's a real credit impairment here, and if there's actually a loss that you know that is not going to be uh, you know this isn't just an interest rate risk. The 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 the, the debts have actually been impaired. If that makes sense. So sorry, there were like four questions in there, Shalom. Where, where, wherever you yes. are. <laughs> Remind me the first one. We'll go one by one, if you don't mind. Sorry. Yeah, the the first one just being like, where, how do you see this playing out with small regional banks? They don't have yeah. access to this BTFP facility, right? It doesn't look like their their loan books are mostly treasury or mortgage backed securities. They're like a big part of it is these uh, commercial real estate loans that they they don't have access to that facility. I don't think it looks pretty. Let's be honest, um, everyone yeah. I've spoken to, um, everyone in my business, like I said, we probably had about a hundred partners in real estate, if I had to guess, that I know of, that had their operating accounts, forget the loans, the regular operating accounts with Signature Bank. Um, anything over you know, $250,000 today, I don't see how anybody would leave it in one of the smaller banks. You know, this bailout was wonderful, and thank God, you know, for all of us, it worked out. Um, but who wants to take that chance? So, mm -hmm. you know, um, money's with our fund, you know, we have a fidelity and, um, you know, Chase Bank. But from what I'm hearing, anyone that has bigger accounts, although they know they're not getting the service, they're putting all the those type of monies, they're putting in the Chase, the JP Morgan, the fidelity, et cetera. Excuse me. And they're just really using, um, if anything, they're using the small banks because they love the service still, because the service was, the service was really impeccable. You know, you could duplicate it, like we said, with the bigger banks. They just couldn't. Um, they'll use them for their operating accounts. And that's mm. what the feeling, the feeling I'm getting. So those small banks, like I say, when we went to these small towns, and, you know, this, you know the bank, bank of Chattanooga and Bank of Pell City and Bank of Dalton and, you know, all these uh, small, wonderful cities in America, um, my guesstimate, I really never went too much into detail with them. You know, we have a lot of our, like, like I said, our day-to-day -day operating accounts with them. But... My my guess is that those banks were really there to service the the local clientele, you know, with the retirement accounts, with the local mechanics, the local, you know, stores, um, the day spas and you know, the restaurants and all that. And those accounts are fifty, hundred thousand dollars a week, month, whatever the situation would be. Um, but I always know because when I went in and went in, they introduced me many times, there was always a few, you know, of the more wealthy, let's say, people that lived in these small towns um, who had a lot of their money with these banks because they believed in the bank and they mm -hmm. wanted to help the bank and they believed in where they lived. Now, if those people, my guess is that the same way we got so many you know, calls from so many investors and people that we had asking where our monies were, et cetera, rightfully so, and wanted to know what was going on. Yeah. I'm sure everybody in you know in America, throughout America, you know, news travels so fast today with the internet. They all know what's going on. Why would anyone leave 
five million or ten million dollars in a regular savings account today in one of these smaller banks with the risk that this could possibly happen and the FDIC is only going to insure you up to $250,000. I don't see any good reason why they would. Yeah. Now, what, what's your, um, so basically the, that, that does sound a little bit dire because I, I agree. It's almost like, what's the upside to keeping your, your funds in a regional bank? I mean, exactly. there's not much upside and there's all the risk in the world, right? Um, especially, especially when you're managing other people's money. <laughs> yeah. So talk, talk a little bit about just commercial real estate as an asset class, obviously a, a gigantic, gigantic asset class. And uh, what I was sort of showing before is that vacancy rates, like we've seen them recover a little bit since the, the COVID lows, but they're not getting back to where they were. And this whole world right now is kind of trying to grapple with, uh, with what do we do? Are we remote first? Are we hybrid? But it looks like the, the verdict is kind of in that we don't know if it's totally remote or if it's hybrid a couple of days a week, but very few firms are moving back to five days in the office. And that's just going to have a permanent impact on vacancy rates, which has an impact on the price of this uh, commercial real estate. So what are your sort of thoughts on just the overall value of commercial real Absolutely. estate? Um, we had a lot of office or, on ourselves so that we managed for ourselves and our partners. Mm -hmm. um, 2002, I would say, into, until 2008. 2008 came, it was tough. We had to restructure. We had to really get involved. And thank God we were successful, basically, in most of our assets. Um, working things out but it was a really a tough time all of a sudden you had we had office buildings and again just so we're clear we're talking about office buildings right now because i know that's what yep. you're showing in your chart yeah um <coughs> sorry so um the office buildings back then you had office buildings that were in the 90s percent high 90 percent um, occupancy and all of a sudden you know you had a law firm accounting firms everybody tons of mortgage brokers they were just leaving and we had offices and friends that we know and people that were helping out we went down into the 40% occupancy from the 90s, from the high 90s. Wow. And that happened quick. It happened within six months. Um, after that, I really lost my appetite for regular big office buildings. And myself and the fund, we actually never bought, um, you know, ourselves with our partners in a big way. We never really bought any big office buildings for that reason. Um, the other thing I also found very tough with office, um, which hasn't changed, is that you know you'll get a beautiful five-year government lease or something like that um, but then when they leave all of a sudden you have to put in a million dollars a million and a half dollars into that space to retenant it again for the next person even if it's a beautiful space that they want a whole different need so all of a sudden you're you're doing a five-year lease and it takes you two and a half usually the mass were a lot of times it will take two and a half to three years to recoup your tenant improvement allowance and your and your broker fees so then the last couple of years, you know, hopefully the, you know, good credit, which most of them were when you're spending that type of money, um, they make it through and you make the money the last couple of years. So just on a personal level, I was already, you know, very worried and weary about office in a big way um, since the crash 2009, 2010. Um, now, obviously, like you said, is it did recover over the, obviously from 2010 and people made a lot of money, um, especially in New York City and other cities. Um, COVID came. It's killed it. We all know, like you said, is um, the amount of people that are working remote, the amount of people that are working elsewhere, um, just not in the office and working one day a week, two days a week. Um, it's just become the new norm. And um, although I personally don't love it, there is a new norm. And of course, there is a lot of pros, as we know, um, to be able to do a hybrid. Um, but the office, you know, the companies, that we're taking 100 square, 100,000 square feet. I'm sure they're not renewing when when their leases are over more than a quarter of that. You know, people definitely want to still have a presence. They still want to have some sort of office. I'm talking again, we're talking about you know bigger companies and law firms and stuff like that. But there's no way in my mind that they're ever coming back close to taking the amount of space that they were taking before. So obviously now we have this you know massive massive vacancy in the market. Um, there are a lot of different people trying to do different things around the country. Um, you know, we get calls all the time, people looking for equity, et cetera, um, to, you know, to renovate and, you know, um, um, take it from office to multifamily, get new zoning, all that kind of stuff. But all, it all takes time. So if you have heavy debt, which a lot of people have, they don't have that time um, to wait the two, three years until they get the zoning from the state and et cetera and redo it and then have the monies to do it. Old, older assets, you know, more mature assets, people that have had them for, you know, 30, 40, 50 years, especially in Manhattan, have low debt or no debt on them at all. 
obviously, you know, they have a lot more options. What's going on, everybody? Thank you for listening to On The Margin. I just wanted to take a quick moment to let you know about a very special offer that we have coming out of BlockWorks Research. Now, many of you will probably be familiar with our platform, but BlockWorks Research is the most blue chip spot to get research, data, governance, models, and a whole lot more about the leading DeFi protocols in the space. I've leaned on our analysts time and time again to explain complicated concepts going on in DeFi to me like I'm five years old. They can do the same for you. If you invest in DeFi or are just interested in it, it is an absolute no-brainer. As a listener of On The Margin, and to say thank you all for listening to the show, you can use Margin 10 for a 10% discount, and that gives you access to everything, which would be weekly in-depth reports, live data, all of that good stuff. So again, that's code MARGIN10 for a 10% discount. Link is in the show notes. Sign up now. Thank you later. So so what is the, uh, you know, if there is some, like a significant re-rating or repricing of commercial real estate what are, what are the overall impacts of that i'd be curious like maybe maybe james is where i could kind of pull you back in here but i think what folks have been curious about right post all this stress in the banking system is people are putting this in the context of what the fed has done for the last year or so right we know that there's a lag in transmission with monetary policy they started hiking i think the first rate hike was march of uh, 22, right? So this would be about the time that you would kind of start to feel this. Lo and behold, one year, you know, post the hike starting, we're starting to see all this stress kind of pop up in, in the banking system where we've seen failures and, and bank runs. So I guess my question to you is like, people are very concerned about like a larger credit event being out there. Um, and, you know, my question to you is like, do you think there is? I think we're getting really close and you know it's, it's concerning because with this non-recourse paper mm-hmm. who's going to eat that to that in, in challenge example who's going to eat that two and a half million dollar loss well the equity holders of the bank are and if you draw down enough of that equity base of the bank then you have this banking issue but you know, by definition with fractional reserve banking if everybody pulls their deposits the business model doesn't work so every That's bank true. has big trouble but then you know, I also look at it and think about, okay, they, they're not going to let deposits go, but they let the equity go. So how painful is the equity loss? But then, you know, if the equity loss is, you know, the banks is zero, then that flows through into the debt. So at some point, you know, the, I think the losses um, get so large that then there's, you know, flow through to different types of entities. And then critically, where does the government backstop? I think they've drawn a line in the sand where they theoretically backed up deposits, but then Yellen kind of walked it back and said, we're not, I don't know why she did that. Um, you know, that risks an even greater crisis. Um, but, you know, in another example, like, I don't think they're going to bail out equity holders. They certainly don't appear like they're going to bail out debt holders of banks. But, you know, I want to get back to real estate. But, you know, when I talked to you last time about the shadow banking sector, you know, think about bank debt. So a lot of this is the direct lending is the new business model where they claim you can get nines and tens with, you know, the same risk as investment grade through these proprietary models. I mean, you know, stress test that it's, it's nonsense, but, you know, here's a large, one of the larger um, levered loan players in the market. And they have a, you know, between these business development companies, you can see exactly what their portfolios own uh, and where they're marking them. So, they're marking you know, basically their entire portfolio of loans down 1%. So their amortized cost is 1% above where the fair value is. Mm. Um, so basically they haven't marked it down whatsoever. But then if you go under the hood a little bit, the debt, uh, the debt and income producing securities in the portfolio are yielding 11.6 at cost, 11.9 at fair value that is up from 9% on both last year. So take a step back. And again, this is a shadow bank, a levered shadow bank, which then levers up this bank debt. What business models are you aware of that could fund successfully at nine, let alone at 12 today? And then those loans are then levered up again. So, you know, the age old adage is, well, you can extend and pretend. And I guess the shadow banks between the private equity lenders, because they're all basically just lending to themselves. In theory, I guess they could just extend and pretend, but with these banks and seeing, you know, where they have far more stringent um, regulations, they can't just extend this stuff and pretend. So 
as maturities start coming in and direct lending in bank debt, I think that is when the real stress test is going to happen. And, you know, I, the math just looks really tricky to me. Yeah. James, can I actually ask you to go a little bit further there? And, and maybe if you could give like a specific example of, you know, we keep referring to this sort of nebulous um sector, which is the shadow banking sector. That was actually a, a term coined by Paul McCulley, uh, who was the CIO at PIMCO for a little while before. This was pre-Great Financial Crisis. I think 2007 is the, the first time that he said this publicly. Uh, and we're actually right. looking here at a chart of assets held by financial institutions without a banking license, which, you know, there are probably a bunch of different ways to measure this sector, but maybe this is this is sort of one of them here. So could could you, um, and that that chart for those who aren't following along on videos going up and up and up to, you know, about 200 and 230 some odd trillion uh, today. So, so can you just give us an example, James, like what, what, what's like a concrete example of, uh, you know, uh, a shadow banking sector kind of entity here? Sure. And I, I think a little bit of background as to why they exist makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So pre 08, where you can see we kind of flatlined, but then the delta on the growth rate in your chart gets much higher after we kind of came out of that um, 08 um, lull. But the big change there was Dodd-Frank, where prior to 08, and certainly going back to the LBO craze and the private equity industry, they would go to your name brand bank, they would give them what's called bank debt. So basically, it's a senior uh, secured note generally they're floating rate and they're very popular they're not publicly listed like a bond generally they're most common in private equity lbos mm. and dodd frank limited the leverage ratio to how high you could basically lend where i think it was about eight times ebitda and for some private equity companies that just didn't work the math didn't work because they have to lever up the equity to get those returns that they were promising their investors so almost out of necessity new institutions popped up many of them subsidiaries or credit funds founded by those very private equity firms to fill in that void where again old model was money center bank issues that $2 billion of bank debt syndicates it to everybody. So you're having credit funds buy it, you're having, um, you know, basically anybody who had a capacity to own CLOs were obviously the huge buyer. Mm. Post 08, now you have, they're saying, well, we need this paper and we're just going to lend it to ourselves and each other. So one form are credit funds at private equity firms. Um, there's something called a BDC, a business development company, which is a listed vehicle that owns and originates these loans uh, and they actually use debt to actually lever up the return on these levered loans um, the other popular business model that has kind of sprung out of the big banks leaving this niche of the market is direct lending where a lot of these credit firms claim to have expertise in lending directly so they're directly originating as opposed to the old model which was a syndicated loan that was originated by a bank they're direct lending. And in many cases, they're holding the entire loan themselves. So in this case, they can just pretend that it's worth par value, even if, you know, it's a, you know, widgets company that suddenly has 14% paper. So these entities, you know, the last point I'll make, which I think is very important, obviously, they're very speculative. There's no banking license, there's no, you know, explicit, you know, government oversight. The problem as I see it, and this might be the cynicism that I've you know, accumulated in my you know, 16 years in the financial services industry, which by the way, started almost on the cusp of the financial crisis, hence the cynicism, who holds all these loans? It's not really rich people, it's pensions and endowments, which the end holder are firefighters, cops, teachers, municipal workers they are the investors of all these credit funds and these private equity firms so you know to go full circle let's say that there is a waterfall in the shadow banking sector um who's holding the bag unfortunately it's teachers and cops and firefighters and we already have a huge problem with the pension system so again like are they systemic so i went on a rant there but i think that's kind of the you need to understand all the moving pieces to really understand what shadow banking is 
Yeah, James, that was so, so helpful. I'm so glad you started, by the way, with, with Dodd-Frank, because I, I agree that's like key to the, how this all worked, right? Basically, you know, to even more watered down and simplified the point that I think you're trying to make is Dodd-Frank basically said, hey, banks, you guys screwed up in 2008, right? We are going to limit your ability to take risk even more. But if there's one thing that we we know about capitalism is basically the uh, the desire for cheap financing is is essentially infinite. So this whole other group of entities basically took up took up that mantle, right? And those were kind of the the credit funds that you were describing before. So the the risk taking didn't stop happening, but it did move out of the banking sector and the financing mechanism changed, right? So now the bag holders aren't necessarily depositors in banks. The bag holders are ultimately people whose pensions are being managed by the state or endowments or, or whatever it is. Is that about the size of it? Basically, yeah. I mean, you know, it, it, you know, as we're as you kind of went through that exercise, it actually reminded me of a similar, albeit much smaller in terms of market share in these public mortgage REITs, whether it's residential or commercial. Mm. Um, Shalma, how big is that in terms of the overall market size? Um, is com- are, are commercial mortgages held by these CMBS and commercial REITs substantial, or is that part of the equation here? Or are you more focused on where the regional banks play in this equation? Both. Um, like I said, the CMBS is basically fully non-recourse, um, but like you said, they're sold back by Wall Street and you know it was endowment funds, etc. <clears throat> the regional is a mix, um, but you have billions of dollars of CMBS. I mean, all the shadow bank. Sorry, but shadow bank is really real estate too. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Um, anyone really, I'm saying in, in in our world that was going for a fifty million dollar plus loan the last few years and wanted non recourse um, in retail or office, it was CMBS. And CMBS were giving a lot of people again, like they did in 2008, they were giving you know completely interest only payments. So for tax purposes and all that are great, you know, and financial cash flow on a daily basis, it's a wonderful thing. Um, non-recourse, um, interest only, and they were giving you a very attractive rate considering considering it was non-recourse. They're actually probably taking a, a slightly more usually, um, a quarter percent more than a regional bank, but it was recourse versus non-recourse. So one you're signing your life away and one you're signing your property away, right? So. Hmm. So what's the like overall, because you know that now there's all these facilities that are basically you know, come up by by the Fed and the FDIC to sort of backstop the the banking system. If I'm if I'm reading correctly, the the implication here, which is there could be shortfalls that ultimately, you know, the the loss is sort of allocated to pension fund holders. I would I would assume that that's a pretty big problem for governments. I, I would assume that they uh, that would be like right at the very tippy top of their list of things that they do not <laughs> want to happen. Um, is defaulting on entitlements, you know, for public sector workers or teachers or firefighters or or what have you. Not good for politicians who want to get reelected. So, you know, I guess if if um sorry, I can never ask one part question. Two part question. What would you what would you put the uh the percentage risk of of something big happening here that could impact people's uh you know pensions or something like that? Um and then what do you think the the response would be? Well, I mean, right if we don't this brings up another really good point because I think and that a lot of people are hoping and praying and thinking that there's going to be substantial cuts by the end of this year. Mm. If that doesn't happen for whatever reason, I think you're going to have to start seeing marks and ugly marks on a lot of these debt portfolios, whether it's CMBS, CLOs, direct lending, the bank debt itself. And then ultimately, you know, the, who are the constituents? It's these pensions. And so imagine, you know, you're grandstanding as a politician, either side of the aisle. Uh, yeah. Who are you going to who are you going to choose? Are you going to vilify the private equity firm that's making, you know, 100 bips on managing the loans plus carry? Uh, or are you going to sit there and protect the firefighters? It, it's tough. I, I don't I mean, I, I have a really tough time putting a handicap on that because I, I think that it, it depends so much on, you know, what does the economy do? What are rates do? But the longer we stay here, the higher the probability is, in my opinion. And again, I think the moral hazard or excuse me, the political hazard, because at the end of the day, they're more concerned with staying in office is saving those entitlements. 
Shlom, what do you think? Can't agree more. Um, the only thing, as I said, is you know we do we do live in. I'll, I'll say this, um, and I'm definitely not as equipped to answer this uh, this uh, question as uh, you both. But I'm more in the real estate world. <coughs> but my dad taught me something very um, substantial, I would say, in 2008, and um, when I saw everything coming crashing down. And he lived in in the U.S. in the 60s, um, the late 60s and uh, 70s. And he said, Shalom, he's like, let me tell you something. In the U.S., as, as quick as it goes down, it will go back up quicker. And I'm being honest with you. I, I love my dad dearly, and uh, I'm sure he'll be watching this at some point. Um, I thought he was a little crazy at the time. I really did. I mean, I was going through, you know, I don't like using the word hell, but it was it was not pretty. Dealing with banks, dealing with investors, you know, restructuring everything we had to do to make sure there was a good outcome for everybody. And it was months and months and months of work. Um, but then all of a sudden, when I saw how it did turn and the opportunities that came from it, um, and, you know, we were able to buy back some of our own debt at 10, 20 cents on the dollar. We were buying back other people's debt and then they didn't have the money to buy up back their debt. And we were lending them money to buy back the debt. And that's what really gave me a really great edge, I would say, into the business. I always say before the crash, I thought I knew real estate. During the crash, I had a crash course and I, I had to learn real estate and what it really means to, you know, low debt and how to restructure and, and how to how to weather the storm. Um, so my feelings are, that, like I said, um, I can't say the same for Europe, but living in the U.S., um, whatever does happen, I think, you know, we saw with COVID for the right and the wrong or the wrong. Many will agree, many, many will disagree. Um, but like you said, a lot of people want to get reelected, et cetera. And I don't think they're going to let anything too crazy happen. Um, I think, you know, they'll make sure bailouts, whatever they have to do of some sort of levels to make sure that we don't get anything too crazy. But along the way, do I think there's going to be a lot of opportunity? And do I think there's going to be a lot of headaches and a lot of, you know, what we saw with Signature Bank, et cetera? The answer is yes. And I think really the first one I think is really going to be is let's watch. I think we're going to see it very quickly. Let's see what happens with all these Signature loans. I believe there's 30 billion dollars, if I'm not mistaken, that they're sitting on right now. The FDIC, mm -hmm. um, as we know, um, Flagstar, New York community, bought the actual bank. I think 3.7 billion, if I'm not mistaken, the deposits and some other of the loans. But they would not touch one of the real estate loans. Um, they were saying, you know, through the articles, that that's because they had enough exposure in New York on 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 regular real estate. Who knows, you know, what the you know if that's the actual only reason. I'm not sure. Um, but the bottom line is, is that we have $30 billion of loans that the government does not want to own. They made that very clear. And I think the next few weeks, we're going to see how they unload that. Are they going to unload that to, you know, a few big institutions um, at 30 cents off the dollar? Are they going to offer it to the, you know, to the borrowers at 10 cents off the dollars, uh, at 10 cents off the dollar? I don't know. You know, or is it going to be a lot worse than that? And I don't think we know. So. Or is it going to be a mix? I think it might be a mix, a mixed bucket. I think they may do different things with different assets and depending, you know, performing, non-performing, how, you know, above water they are, et cetera. But I think the next few weeks, that will be the telling story. Because I think once we see what they do with that 30 billion, then unfortunately, if there is other banks that are in similar situations um, throughout, you know, a lot of these regional banks that we spoke about, they'll probably unfortunately follow the same pattern. So that's my... And I think the really important, you know, parallel there to the 08 example, but also, you know, looking at, okay, are these loans going to be available at 30 cents on the dollar, you know, at the right price, everything is really interesting. And so it's, right. it's popular right now for people on Twitter or on podcasts or in the press to say how horrible the world is and how bad things are going to get. But what are the opportunities? Like, what can you buy? What can you start to get on your radar to buy? And you know, I think the, what our profession, our job is to figure out how do you preserve capital, but then also how do you go on, on offense? And this could be a generational opportunity, whether it's now, three months from now, or six months from now. I absolutely agree. The opportunity I think here is, is here. Um, like I said, I, I don't think we know exactly how big or small it will be, but it's definitely here. We've waited for this, you know, opportunity the last few years, you know, when I started um, a real estate fund in 2015, I believe, you know, it was a funny time, you know, the market was high and maybe because of so much that I've seen through my, you know, couple of decades in real estate, I really like to buy real estate low or, you know, or distressed. 
um, and then either sell or just stabilize it. Um, so in 2015, it was, you know, like a funny time and it just kept going up and up and nobody knew where the top was. You know, I thought 2017, 2018 was the top and obviously it wasn't. It kept going and going and going. Um, so I think we have to see from there where it really all falls out, shakes out um, compared to 2008. But no question, the opportunity, the opportunity between now and the next six months is definitely it's here. Um, they're not on the table today. Um, you know, I've been speaking to a lot of people in signature, et cetera. I know a lot of, you know, people in that world. Um, it's not there yet, but in the next few weeks, I know the FDIC definitely wants to try and unload. So, yeah, I, um, you know, one of those examples, you just made me think of, it wasn't signature, but it was Silvergate. I think MicroStrategy had a $205 million loan, uh, and they paid, paid that back in full for $161 million. So. You know, that's a handy it's a little, <laughs> yeah, it's a good little trade uh, that they pulled there. Um, so, you know, my question to you guys that, you know, you just kind of teed me up for is where do you see the opportunity, right? Like what we've, you know, what we've been talking about on most of this podcast is stress in the, in the commercial real estate sector. Um, and I, I think to, to maybe summarize, uh, James, the point that you were making, uh, this is a paraphrase, but there's no such thing as a bad asset. There's just a bad price, right? So uh, is the idea just that, um, at some point, commercial real estate becomes kind of attractive once maybe there's been a little bit of forced selling. Are there other areas that might be tertiary or adjacent to commercial real estate or might be financed by the kind of shadow banking sector that also might present some interesting opportunities? Like where are you guys kind of turning your nose up and saying, oh, this is something we should be paying attention to? You want me to take a question? Yeah. yeah. Sure. So yeah, um, I think the opportunity definitely is there. Banks have tightened up. For obvious reasons, um, rates are high. Um, we've been in the bridge world, you know, um, through my fund and just through, like I said, lending um, on the side. So, why don't, you, well, why don't you explain exactly what a bridge loan is, like what the collateral, what the terms are for for Mike's listeners? Absolutely, yeah, that'd be great. Thanks. So yeah, so a bridge loan basically is a lot of times the banks um, either you will not have the time, you won't have the two or three months that you need when you're going to contract on a new property to get to the bank. Um, to go through their process, which sometimes is just very slow, not always for any good reason, just the way the banks work. Um, so a lot of times, you know, people will need to close in 30 days on a deal. Why? Let's say they're getting an attractive deal. The seller needs to move money somewhere else. He has to buy another asset. He needs to close. He's like, you know what? I'll give you a better deal if you close quickly. So obviously then cash is king, right? Which it usually is, um, but especially in those situations. So you don't always have that cash. So, you know, you have people bridge, you know, they call them bridge lenders. Um, so we've always done some of that in our portfolio. We've always done some bridge lending. A lot of times, you know, the rates can be very attractive. Um, and you're basically, you know, you have basically the same collateral as a bank. Um, you have the 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 uh, asset, obviously, and you have the PG. You know, you always have a personal guarantee usually when you're doing the bridge lending. Um, so I think in that world, I mean, I know for the, the calls that we're getting already, um, there's definitely an uptick on that big time. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of the banks just don't know what they want to do right now. You know, they want to see how things shake out. Um, and also, you know, the, the the spread between, you know, we do bridge loans that we've been doing, depending on the climate, depending on the asset, depending on the borrower, you know, anywhere between nine and 13, 14% on a bridge loan, mm -hmm. you know, on a first mortgage. Um, now the banks are, people are construction loans, People had a three and a half percent that we're talking about before. Those loans now are eight, nine percent. So for mm -hmm. now, for a borrower to come and say, you know what, I'd rather pay you 12 percent. And I know you're going to close me in 30 days. I know who you are. I don't, there's not as much red tape. Um, I know what you're looking for, you know, you want to have a clean title. You want to make sure there's a survey. You want to make sure it's an appraisal. You want to make sure it's a clean environmental. You want to make sure the rent roll is correct. Um, but we're doing almost the same things as a bank, you know. Um, and obviously we can, you know, turn things around a lot quicker. So I think that world's going to be definitely a lot, lot of opportunity, <clears throat> excuse me, as well as I think there's going to be massive opportunity from people. And I think this is going to be a lot more work. Um, you know, a lot of people come to us all the time to invest monies um, through the fund or like I said, through some of our other vehicles that we have um, in their deals. Um, so a lot of those people that have bought those deals the last few years, especially a ton of multifamily, out, out of state, um, you know, these are big, big size portfolios, you know, 200 units, 400 units, 600 units. Um, 
And a lot of them, like we we're talking about at the beginning, you know, they're all on, you know, these floating rates, um, which have now gone crazy. And for them to buy a cap, you know, so the rate doesn't go over a certain amount, they all have to put up a lot of money. And a lot of their syndications, a lot of, you know, these people all syndicated these deals through partners. You know, they put together the monies, you know, 3 million, 5 million, 10 million, and they're out of money. So now they don't have enough to buy down the cap, to pay the mortgage. Um, so I think over there, we, you know, we're, we're going to see for us personally, we love that kind of stuff. We're going to see a lot of that opportunity. And I think now it's just going through, you know, which assets do we think are just too far gone? Let's just call a spade a spade. You know, the two highly leveraged. And then obviously they're just going to have to either work it out with a bank direct or, you know, or, um, you know, or give up the asset, et cetera. And unfortunately, the investors will lose their money, which is never a good thing. Or so I think there's going to be plenty of those assets that just need, you know, a second capital capitalization, some new influx of new capital. And I think they'll definitely make it through. They just don't have enough capital. And those ones are the ones I think, you know, that we can definitely, you know, people like ourselves can definitely take good um, advantage of in a good way um, to become part of those, you know, entities, take them over. Um, don't wipe the other investors out. Just, you know, make sure we're in a good position that obviously, you know, um, we're protected. But, you know, hopefully markets go back, things go back up, rates come back down at some point, And, you know, they save their equity and we make some money along the way. So that's where I really see the opportunity right now. Um, and obviously, I think there's never been a time like it in many years in our, you know, in our time that obviously cash is king, really cash is king right now. Yeah, I, I can't stress, I can't stress that enough. The difference between your cash on cash yields, your covenants or protections, whether it's a senior position or there's a personal guarantee behind that versus if you were to go out and buy a CMBS REIT or a BDC or all of these publicly listed entities that are still marking things at par relative to a year ago, you know, fine. But if you have that fresh capital right now, the spread between what you're seeing in the real world versus what if you were to just put your money into some of these listed entities that haven't taken the marks yet is just night and day. So one of them is right. My bet is that the, where the fresh money is pricing tends to be right. And you know, I saw you know a great, I think it was on Jack's podcast where he had uh, the head of real estate at Cohen and Steers, where he said, it's not that abnormal to see these ridiculous um marks on real estate it lags so at what point can they no longer justify marking some of these privates at where they are is it six more months is it nine more months you know are they just trying to pray that they can get a year and then rates are lower and they could maybe fudge the mark a little bit more but again fresh like cash i don't want to repeat y'all but cash is king but if you have new capital to put into kind of these types of opportunities right now the spreads relative to where things are priced right now is just like mind numbing. Hello, hello everyone. Thank you all for listening to On The Margin. Just wanted to give you guys a heads up about a conference that we have coming up in the new year called Permissionless. I'm sure most of you have been there last year. Uh, it is the cultural event of the year. We had over 5,500 people down in Palm Beach. This year we are moving to Austin, Texas. You know what they say about Texas. Everything's bigger in Texas. <laughs> Uh, so last year, we had a really great lineup of speakers. We had two co-founders of Robinhood, Vlad Tenev and Baiju Bhatt. We had Chris Dixon. We had some of the folks that have been on the show a whole bunch of times. Jim Bianco, Dan Tapiero. Just a phenomenal lineup of speakers, and you can expect the same this year. If you use Margin 10, you'll get 10% off on a ticket. Again, that's Margin 10, because I love you guys so much. Click the link at the bottom of the show notes. Hope to see you there in person. Now, what about, could I, could I actually get your opinion on like more of the, you know, the, the other shoe to drop that people have been talking about for a long time, but hasn't necessarily happened yet is, uh, you know, private markets like, uh, you know, venture capital or private equity. And, you know, there's this article, there's a great article in Bloomberg that came out, uh, SVB collapse could be in a $500 billion venture capital haircut, right? Um, because a lot of the, uh, you know, the collateral that was being pledged in Silicon Valley Bank was actually equity in some of these startups. And, you know, the new owners of that are gonna gonna want a more realistic mark. So, you know, the the, the public and private market valuations don't necessarily move in lockstep. We've probably seen a much more significant re-rating in public markets than than privates. So I'm just curious about your thoughts if their shoe to drop is dramatic. When when do private markets kind of start to normalize in the same way that we've seen them move in public markets? 
you know, I'll talk about the VC world. I'll, I'll, um, yeah. I'll defer to Shalom on real estate, but you know, they have to converge over time. They can only right. deviate for so long where, you know, the, the common anecdote is the public markets overshoot on the upside, overshoot on the downside. But ultimately, these VC marks have to meet somewhere in the middle. And you know, curiously, to start this year, even before SVB, well, actually, the, the resilience has been really strong. And, you know, I use the GS profitless tech index as kind of my barometer for where public markets are for kind of the super long duration profitless business models. Mm. That has bounced violently this year. And it began long before SVB. And I think it was based on you, know, you look at Fed fund futures and you look at um, inflation break evens. The world is assuming and starting to price these assets for 2% or less CPI uh, by the end of the year and radically lower interest rates. Mm. Personally, I'm going to take the other side of that bet. And I think that that even the public call it public VC world is still overpriced. And so the private world, ultimately, they cannot just mark at this big of a spread forever, whether LPs need to get liquidity, um, the companies themselves have to do down rounds where I think it was Stripe. I, I don't know if they priced at 55 or, fi or 50 billion relative to trying to raise not too long ago at 100, but that's going to be more and more common and that's gravity. So are they, they'll probably meet somewhere in the middle unless we go lower in publics, but um, eventually I think that that's the outcome. But at least so far to start this year, the market seems to be pricing a bidding duration, whether it's just algos doing mean reversion, which is probably my bet, or people actually thinking that marginally lower rates by the end of this year are going to help companies that have no prayer of making money. You know, who knows? Maybe that, that maybe that's their bet. But again, just like the just like every other public and private has to converge. It's just a question of when and is it in the middle? Is it at the public or is it the private? I'm guessing closer to public and sooner than later. Yeah. And and I, I hate to make you guys do this, but if you had to, you know, brush off your your tea, pour your tea leaves out and, and try to get a sense of like what the Fed is going to do here. You know, usually I kind of look at the there's the Fed funds futures. There's also the two year, right, which is very correlated with with uh, Fed funds. And two years been kind of wild. I mean, it um, you know, when these banking failures started, it plummeted like 100 basis points in the span of a week. It's bounced a little bit. Uh, you know, Fed funds futures have been all over the place as well. Market is just repricing in different outcomes what do you think the Fed is going to do here? Because, you know, we're having this conversation, which is all very well and good about all this stress that's both in the banking sector and the shadow banking sector, and they're going to have to step in and, and bail people out. But on, on the other hand, we still have a six handle on inflation. And that's one of their explicit mandates, right? Is price stability is one of their, there's, you know, employment and price stability. So what, what are they going to do about this? I'll go first quickly, but you know maybe I'm talking my own book a bit as uh, having a hard asset inflation mandate. But a lot of the things that have rolled over and are helping them with inflation right now, I think there's a potential to see a lot of these markets higher, particularly energy prices and industrial metal prices. And I won't go into the thesis, but if that starts to work against them rather than in their favor, they're going to have stickier CPI numbers. I mean, the resilience of the U.S. economy has been pretty startling, shocking to me in and of itself if wages hang in there. But things are breaking and breaking fast. So ultimately, you know, let's view the Fed for what I think it is now, which is a extension of uh, a political you know, arm of the government. What are you going to choose? Are you going to implicit they'll never explicitly accept a higher inflation target they will do it implicitly i think they're going to do that because they're going to have to and by virtue of that they're going to have to ease in the face of sticky and stronger uh inflation prints so you know it's not gonna, that doesn't mean you know a rose colored outcome because if you're a company that can't pass on inflation marginally lower rates doesn't necessarily help but the status quo, I don't think is tenable. And I think that that wage and commodity component of CPI could really put them, paint them into a corner by, you know, July, if not September. It's, can I just ask a quick follow up, um, Shalom, before we get into your, your thoughts there? What, is the, what does that mean, explicit versus implicit? Uh, can you, what does that mean? Yeah. So go back to Greenspan. He never actually communicated his inflation target. 
Mm -hmm. Um, We just know after the fact that it was 2%, and I won't get into the history, but um, I always mess up the name. It's Nate Silver's company, 548 or 538. Oh, okay. they did a they did a historical review of where two percent came from um moral it was actually 538 mm-hmm. it was made up by the central bank of new zealand in the 1980s as just sounding pure qualitatively it sounded like a good rate you know not too high not too low <laughs> then i think australia formally adopted it then europe formally adopted it but then even during greenspan he never explicitly said it's two. It wasn't until Bernanke that we said, oh, now we're at two as well. But you have all these academic papers that say, where does two come from? In fact, three or four might be the better number for um, basically middle income wages and overall economic growth. The problem is that you know, you're fighting perception. So if they explicitly change to four, I don't even wanna think about what's gonna happen in the market. But I think what they're going to do is um, implicitly say, look, guys, we're going to let this run three, four, five, and just continue to just throw water on kind of narratives that say that we're not inflation targeting, because ultimately, I think the economy does fine at three or four. Mm. Um, But again, that's why I mean implicit. I don't think they would ever explicitly say our target has changed, certainly not for many, many years. Yeah, you you make a really compelling point. I, you know, one little sort of pet theory of mine as well is like eventually I think all we're we're headed towards at least some form of yield curve control, uh, you know, because the Fed's going to want to have their cake and and eat it too. But it's very unlikely that they'll just come out and say, hey, we're uh, we are implementing yield curve control, right? There will be, they won't call it that. And there will be these, uh, like, honestly, you know, people are exhausting a lot of brain power on whether BTFP is. QE, I, my personal thought is that it's not. It actually looks a little bit more like uh, some soft form of yield control, uh, yield curve control for banks, because it, this is a form of having their cake and, and eating it too, right? Um, they bonds are for one small sector of the financial economy trading where they want it to trade, um, not where the market is actually pricing it. So, and this is my long rambling way of saying I, I agree with you, James. I think that's highly likely. And uh, and if people want, there was a great interview that we did with uh, Vincent De Luart, uh, who was talking about you know Fed pays enormous atten- amount of attention to their R star, which is their kind of theoretical neutral rate, uh, as opposed to like I star, uh, which is something that Vincent pays a lot of attention to, which is the natural rate of inflation in the economy. Um, so, just a little bookend to that, but. Um, Guys, this has been, uh, you've, you've already been generous with your time. We're, we're a little over here. Any um, any closing thoughts that, that you just wanted to share or make sure that, you know, the audience kind of walks away with? Put either one of you on the spot. I'll defer to you, Shalom. I think, um, you know, I'll just quickly just say, look, I think that there's a great opportunity here. And, you know, don't be fearful. I think, think about what the opportunity set is, not, you know, the fear of the headlines and, you know, scars are, Mine certainly haven't healed yet from 08, 09, but, you know, let's get it, get out some, uh, get out the, the uh, first aid kit and start thinking ahead instead of thinking in the rear view mirror. James, I think you said it absolutely beautifully. The opportunities here, like I said, you just said in 2008, we learned so much um, and, and, and it doesn't last long. Like you said, you know, if the opportunity does come, you know, especially I think the U.S. Uh, government, they want to move it along. And if there is, you know, bailouts or whatever it's going to be, sell offs. They want to move it along quickly so that things can restart again. And that's what I really learned from last time. I've been reading up, you know, throughout the U.S. Uh, history. That's happened many times. So the opportunity, I think, like you said, is right, definitely here. I'm not saying it's here today, but it's going to be here. I think it's definitely a good time to definitely invest in good assets and, you know, in, in, in things that you believe in. Um, real estate, obviously, is something that I obviously, obviously always believe in. And I've been in it since uh, 2001, like I said. Um, and I think it's really, I think if you can go into assets today that have some sort of cash flow, whether with debt or without debt, you know, with some value add, and then all of a sudden rates do come down, things change and you refinance, you take your money out, you just, your returns go up either way. It's a win-win. So, mm. well, you know what they, you know what they say about, uh, real estate, Shalom, they're not making any more of it. So probably, probably a good. <laughs> and 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 with the numbers that we know that are coming into this country every single day, I think they're saying now fifteen thousand people a day, if I'm not mistaken. Mm. Is that correct? I, I think no that's idea. the number right now. I mean, it's 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 in the thousands. 
So mm -hmm. do the math. You know, the, you were showing a graph, you know, of, of the um, of the office sector, and without taking too long. But if you look at the um, the ones of the multifamily, they're obviously they're up there, but there is a little bit of vacancy, and we we're still trying to understand that how can there still be vacancy with all these thousands of people coming in every day, and we know that you know the government wants to house them and they need to be housed somewhere. So I'm not quite sure. So I agree with you; they're not making any more. So yeah. Yeah. You know, it's 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 tough. Um, this is this is one of those things where it's it's hard to put exact numbers on, and it, with work from home and stuff, I mean, yeah, you're never going to get people like fully back, but people got to live somewhere. So I'm not a real estate expert, so I, I can't. But remember. you're absolutely right. You can yeah. you can take that off the space and do a lot with it. So yeah, I can make dad jokes about real estate though. That's something I am qualified to do. <laughs> um, awesome guys, thank you uh, so so much for for coming on the show. We will uh, we'll have to do it again sometime. We'd love to. That'd be great. Cheers, guys. Great speaking with you guys. Thank you so much.